welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. Uh, and we're out today. I'm joined by the mighty Laura Jane Dodd, head book buyer of Forbidden Planet. And we are both privileged to be joined by the one, the only, Jay Christoph. How are you, mate? I'm good, mate. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well indeed. Um, Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it really is our pleasure to have you on board, board mate. As we were just saying off camera, uh, Laura's a huge fan of your work and uh, was highly excited when we managed to put this interview together. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're, we're here to talk to you actually about your, your new novel, Empire of the Vampire. And um, without further ado, I'll let, I know Laura's got a ton of questions about this, so I'm going to let her jump yes. in first. Yeah, so let's start with, so why vampires? I've loved them since I was a kid. Uh, I mean, they're different things to different people, but the, the first vampires that I met when I was a kid was probably Salem's Lot, uh, Stephen King. I started reading Stephen King when I was 10 years old, which probably... Uh, my parents wouldn't have approved of if they had have known at the time, but I, I turned out okay for a given value of okay. But Mark Petrie, who's one of the heroes in that book, he was kind of the first time I remember seeing myself in the book. He was like the classic kid who knew what the adults didn't understand and the vampires were taking over his town. But, you know, I, I grew up with old kind of school scary vampires. So Interview with a Vampire and Salem's Lot and Fright Nights and um, vampires were kind of monstrous creatures and over the years they've kind of become, well they've evolved I guess um, they've become different things to different people and one of my goals when writing Empire was to bring them back to that kind of monstrous origin that I grew up with as a kid, uh, you know they've become romantic love interests and anti-heroes and you know that's all great and wonderful, the cool thing about vampires they can be a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people but I wanted to use them to explore the monstrous side again, I guess. Uh, it was something I hadn't seen for a while and now are the ones that I grew up with. Yes, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I love the kind of um, coming back to, I suppose, what I consider the quintessential vampire, that it's kind of the, you know, the, the satire, the kind of wit, but also being just very evil and not yeah, necessarily yeah. a love interest. So No, I mean, it, to me, that makes a lot of sense. If, if you're... You know, if you've been alive for 400 years and you're killing somebody every night to maintain your own existence, you're probably not going to see people as people anymore. You're going to yeah. see them as food. Mm -hmm. You will see them the same way that you or I see our hamburger that we have for dinner. Yeah. You know, the hamburger might occasionally talk back to you, but it's still just food. Um, so Empire, I mean, Empire is a story about how nothing kind of lasts forever. And one of those things is the morality of creatures who become these monsters that prey on us for food. You know, they, they, they see us with, yeah, they, they see us with the same lack of compassion that I looked at the steak with when yeah. that I ate for dinner tonight. So. I mean, I think, uh, I think Salem's Lot is such an interesting starting off point because not only is it, you know, a celebration of the classic vampire, but it's kind of a, a dry run for The Shining as well, you know, with regard to the, the identity of the house actually being a thing. You know, I mean, it's like whenever I, I always fascinated me that the sense of place, you know, that uh, the, the, where the vampire installs himself inside the town, it's 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 an evil house with an evil history and whatnot. And I, I felt, yeah, that, sure, yeah, yeah, uh, it's it's a le legacy of horror, yeah, yeah, it's a legacy, yeah, yeah. yeah, right on, um, yeah. So so it does the, the book, right? You've got some amazing uh, character development in the book including with the hunter and i hope i'm saying the name right uh gabriel de leon yeah yeah right? i mean i i i pronounce it gabriel yeah um yeah. but the wonderful thing about books is the characters are yours now as well as mine so you can pronounce it however it. you like yeah so how how do you how do you pull off that trick of making the the, the dark areas the gray areas so likable because I, I think that's one of the keynotes of your writing actually um, I tend to rely on humor a lot. Uh, humor is kind of a, a shortcut to likability. Um, and Gabriel is possessed of the same kind of self-deprecating humor that I think is pretty common among Australians. You know, we, we have a thing here. I don't know if it's, it's in the UK. We have a thing here called tall poppy syndrome. Like if people get too big for their boots, the, the, the poppy that grows too tall gets cut down to size. So our humor by its nature is kind of self-deprecating and, and Gabriel is possessed of that same kind of self-effacing wit, I guess. But yeah, humor is something that I've often used. I use it in Nevernight as well. Um, Nevernight would be a pretty 
dark story at the end of the day if, if you didn't insert that kind of nervous giggle. One of my editors calls it the nervous giggle, making someone laugh right before something awful happens. Um, but yeah, it, it's that is a shortcut to likability. So I try and make him entertaining to listen to. I mean, it's it's really, I mean, Gabriel sitting in a prison cell drinking five bottles of wine and telling his life story. I wanted to, to feel like a story that someone could be telling you down a pub almost. You know, the fact that they're in a prison cell and he's awaiting the execution is almost superfluous. I wanted the tone to be conversational. And there's nothing boring and nothing more boring than listening to someone who's not entertaining when they speak. So, yeah, I, I, want, I wanted it to be an entertaining oral history, I guess. And one of the ways to do that is try and make people laugh. I don't know if they succeed or not. I've kind of read the book so much now that all the jokes, they're not funny to me anymore, but people assure me it's funny. So hopefully yeah, you found yeah. it the same. You've definitely succeeded, mate. Yeah, there's no two ways about it. <laughs> yeah, it is. Oh, it's such great fun. And the book kind of jumps backwards and forwards in time too. Was that quite hard to keep track of? Like, are you a planner or a seat of your pants kind of author? <sighs> I am a seat of my pants kind of author, but there came, Empire is the hardest book that I've ever written um, from a technical standpoint, but also for the subject matter, it's, it's quite heavy, it's quite dark. Um, and I reached a point kind of in late 2019 where I realized that even though I don't traditionally plot, I had to actually grab the book by the shoulders and kind of make it sit down and plot out everything that was going to happen because making those two timelines weave in and out of each other and having kind of revelation in one inform action in the other, knowing what to tell people and what to imply and what to leave unsaid. Yeah, I, I needed to actually sit down and plot really for the first time in my life. So that was hard. Um, I was away. I was, I was on tour for Dark Dawn at the end of 2019 and wound up in Prague for a book festival there. And I rented a room in Prague and just stayed in that room for a month because Prague's a pretty gothy city. If you're going to write a yeah, vampire right, book, it's really probably is. not a bad place to be. Um, and basically plotted out the rest of that novel. So it was probably only a third of the way done then. And I had to really figure out exactly what was going to happen and when, um, when those switches were supposed to happen and what would happen in each to make each one entertaining and also informing the other. So yeah, technically speaking, it's, it's way the hardest book that I've ever written. It's the biggest book. It's the hardest book, but I honestly think it's the best book as well by a country mile. <laughs> do, do you think you'll change your writing process now or will this kind of, will you go back to like winging it? <laughs> I'm working on book two at the moment and I'm, I'm winging it a little, um, <laughs> but I can, I can see that point coming where I actually do have to sit down and plot it again. You know, th these are bigger books than I've ever written before. There's so much going on. And again, in book one, there's kind of the dual time loans weaving back and forth. In book two, there's dual POVs. There's, there's another storyteller that gets involved. So figuring out what each of the characters know uh, and what they should be revealing again, I'm, I'm just not clever enough to hold all that in my head. So at some point, I'm going to have to, and I hate it too, I'm, I'm really quite bad at it, So, but I'm, I'm going to have to sit down and actually plan out the rest of the book. Um, so wish me luck. <laughs> <laughs> Everything cross. Um, yeah. Now, uh, vampires are making a, another resurgence of late with the animated Castlevania, with some fantastic sure. books that came out, like Seven Guides to Slaying Vampires and The Damned. Why do you think they keep coming back from the dead? I mean, they're different things to different people, I guess. Um, when I grew up, they were monsters, then they became romantic love interests and anti-heroes. Depending on who you are, they'll appeal to you for a number of different reasons. And there's not a lot of monsters that actually do that, you know werewolves are pretty straight laced zombies are even more straight laced vampires yeah. can be you know they can be sexy they can be scary they can be power fantasies they can be explorations on morality or immortality the passage of time like there's a whole bunch of variants that you can bring to the equation so it doesn't surprise me that a bunch of different authors have had a bunch of different takes a bunch of different creators have had a bunch of different takes and i think that I guess that flexibility allows them to adapt to whatever people are into at the time. I guess, you know, early 2000s, it was the romantic love interest. It was Twilight and Vampire Diaries and, you know, that's all great. Um, maybe now we're moving into darker times when we're going to go back to exploring them as, as a darker theme. Um, but I think they have a bunch of different appeals to a bunch of different people, which is why, pardon the pun, they're, they're very hard to kill. They don't die that easy. They just keep coming back. Fair enough. Um, now this book definitely ain't for kids. Um, how, no. 
<laughs> how no. do you or Harper, and it's Macmillan in the US, isn't it? How do you kind of, I suppose, police that? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to tell anyone what they can and can't read. Um, I, like I say, I was reading Stephen King at 10 and I turned out okay. Um, I would think the fact that this thing's like 800 pages long would probably be pretty intimidating to a 10 or 11 year old. Um, but also, you know, aesthetically speaking, um, language speaking, you know, it, it is pretty apparent that it's an adult story. Um, the package that we've put together, the language that I'm writing in, um, and, you know, I do my best to let everybody know on social media because I do write in YA and adult. I let people know ahead of, well ahead of time that, you know, this one is going to be a little bit heavier and a little bit darker. So if that's not your jam, that's totally fine. Again, I don't want to police what anybody is reading because I've read some pretty heavy stuff when I was a kid, but I want to make sure that everybody knows what they're getting into before they pick up the book. Um, so, yes, if you're watching this, Empire is definitely not, <laughs> definitely not YA. If you see it in the YA section, <laughs> move it for me if you can <laughs> i mean on that not ya note we were talking before we were chatting with you and uh and i know laura is uh, like a huge fan of both the us and the uk covers for the book which she describes as rock as fuck I mean, yeah they are. <laughs> yeah so, so so um yeah I, 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 were you involved in the were you involved in the development of those epic covers yeah i was um I used to be an art director by trade. That's what I yeah. did for a day job for a long time. I worked in advertising. Um, but Which I mean, the, we the were really lucky. We have sold us, by the way. If you uh, if you are oh, working in advertising, yeah, yeah. yeah no, don't <laughs> yeah. do it. Don't do it. There's not a lot of joy there. Giving up your creativity to yeah. convince people to buy things they don't need with money they don't have. That was my job for a long time. Um, but it's useful in the sense that I can talk designer because I used to be one. So. You know, in the UK, Michaela, who's the designer, and Kirby Rosanas, who's the illustrator, we were kind of kicking around ideas pretty early. I, you know, I wouldn't be too prescriptive, but I would throw a bunch of ideas at Kirby and Michaela, and they would go away, work something up, bring it back, and I would help them refine it. So I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be a third cook in the kitchen, but it's useful to be able to talk to them in the same language that they're used to wearing. Um, in the US, I was a little more involved. Uh, I basically briefed Jason Chan directly, who's our amazing illustrator. Um, and he threw a bunch of ideas in a bunch of different directions. And I picked what I thought would be the most interesting one. And then he worked up you know, his vision for it. So again, I didn't want to be too prescriptive and tell him what to do. I, I gave him a mood and a direction and he kind of took it that way. Uh, and similarly with the typography, it, it's the typography was designed for the US cover by this amazing designer, Meg Morley, that I actually met through the book community. She used to be a book blogger way back in the day. And she would occasionally just put up her own alternative designs for book covers that she liked. Uh, and I realized that she was an incredible typographer. So we got her to do the typography on the Nevernight covers, which uh, the US cover, which is beautiful type. And this time we figured we would get her to do the same. So she was the typographer in charge of that. And again, I just give a brief and then kind of let people go. Um, you know, that's the cool thing about working with talented people. You don't need to be too prescriptive. You just point them in a direction and they do amazing stuff. Yeah, it was um, it was quite the testament that the Forbidden Planet special edition broke the internet. So, yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's, I know, that's really gratifying. Uh, I mean, I, I've got did. the best really readers did. in the world. Um, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the hype for this book has been crazy. I've never really seen anything like it, but it's been building off the back of never night really, you know, Never Night was a series that didn't get any promotion from the publishers. You know, I was kind of a baby author back when it came out, but, you know, it, it built up on the back of word of mouth and this amazing readership that would proselytize for it. You know, they're the kind of people, they don't just say, oh, I read this cool book on the weekend. They shove it in your face and mm -hmm. say, you have to read this thing. So, you know, that kind of built up over the course of three or four years of Never Night. So by the time Dark Dawn came around, even though we had no marketing budget, no advertising, it, it went on to be an international bestseller. And Empire is pretty much a spiritual successor to the Nevernight series. It's got that same kind of aesthetic. It's kind of dark and gothy and bloody and smutty. It's it's the same, very much the same feel. So people who came in on the back of Nevernight are, have just been hype about Empire ever since it got announced. So, But it is really cool to see them constantly breaking uh, I, I apologize that your website got broken, but but uh, 
it's awesome that people are that enthusiastic about it. Yeah, it's really gratifying. I mean, I'm fine with it. I just, when the head of IT messaged way, me right, saying, oh, yeah. yeah, he messaged me saying, uh, you've broken the internet. And I was like, bigger than Kim K. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, not, not quite. <laughs> no, no, not quite. Uh, but it, yeah, it, it, it's it's very cool. It's, it's cool that people are excited. It's, you know, it's a book that I've been working on for kind of four years now. It's a huge chunk of my life. And it was the hardest book that I've ever written. But I think it's the best book that I've ever written. So to see people kind of jump on the back of it and be hype about it. And I'm getting fan art made for it and cosplay made for it before the book's even been released. I've never seen anything like that before in my life. So um, yeah, awesome, it's, that's it's amazing. Fantastic. Yeah, that's fantastic. Laura, we're racing towards the end. So you've got time for two more questions, mate. Okay. So um, let's, I've devised a vampire off to see who, okay. who would win in a right. battle of good versus evil, broody versus bubbly, and we have uh, lazy versus ambitious. So in right. round one, we've got Blade versus Lestat. Who would win? In turn, what's sorry? What criteria so like are we a, judging by? It's a battle to the death. So it's good versus evil in our first round. So who's going to win? Is it Blade? I suppose like the anti-hero good, and then Lestat. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's pretty amoral, and yeah, Blade, Blade is an anti-hero, but he's still a hero. He's trying to make the world a better place. Lestat is totally not. So yeah, Lestat wins. Sorry, Blade. We're a big fan of Blade. <laughs> <laughs> I feel he might have got an unfair run there, going who gets probably the yeah. most famous vampire in fiction outside of Dracula. But <laughs> he's a tough man to beat. Sure, like the Lion Court. So we've got um, Broody versus Bubbly. So it's going to be Bill Compton from True Blood versus yep, the Count Mayor. from Sesame Street. <laughs> so who wins broody versus bubbly i'm mean, yeah. bill with broody and the count wins <laughs> bubbly right yeah um i'm a i'm a i'm a bigger fan of sesame street so i'm gonna go with the count I, oh, I, uh, yeah i think that's exactly the right Fair choice enough. yeah i think the you count know. wins yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah for, sure. for sure and in the the last round we've got lazy versus ambitious so we've got laszlo from what we do in the shadows and uh camilla from castlevania I mean, I just watched the latest. Uh, can, can we get into spoilers here? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just watched Camilla get killed like three days ago. No, it's. So. it's, I, it's I, uh... <laughs> I was, I was quite sad about the way she got taken out. So I think I'm going to give her a Guernsey just because I was sad to see her go. She oh. was one of the more interesting of the crew. So. Yeah. Definitely. I thought it was weird the way they took her out as well. Um, it's yeah. kind of a secondary character. I agree. Yeah, who just kind of walked in and yeah yeah she she was a cooler character than that I, it seemed I very like arbitrary more didn't legs it? Her. Her, her, it was weird but yeah, i guess yeah. they're, they're probably working on a timeline it's like season four now i mean how long is the show actually going to go for yeah but um it is a weird it's that show is a really interesting dynamic the way belmont who is ostensibly the hero has almost been sidelined for like two seasons now there's all this vampire stuff going on that he's pretty much had nothing to do with anyway I digress. <laughs> but yeah, I give Camilla the Guernsey, Guernsey just out of uh, sympathy for the way she got taken out. Hey, Fair Laura, before Fair you enough. jump into your last question, mate, I, I've got one, which is the question I always ask when on vampire interviews is, um, have you ever seen The Night Stalker? The cold chat the, movie? No, I haven't. I haven't mate, heard of that so, at all. So you've got, you've, got to, you've got to watch it. So it's an American okay. TV movie from the, from the early 70s. Stars Darren McGavin, who's the guy who plays the dad in A Christmas Story. Have you ever seen that movie? Um, yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, he's a really well-known American TV actor. But uh, The Night Stalker, it was the was a TV movie that then began a whole series about his character. But he plays like right. a washed-up journalist called Carl Kolchak. And he figures, and he's, he's covering a story in Vegas... And then he, he, he realises there's a serial killer operating in Vegas. And he realises at a certain point that it's actually a fucking immortal vampire called Jane Oscorzini, uh -huh. who is holed up in, in, in Vegas, taking people out. And, and it's very much in the era where, where, you know, vampire movies have gone away for a long time. And right. a big part of it, 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 its tropes have been used so many other times that when you watch it now, you know what's happening right from the get go. But back in yeah, the day, yeah, sure, because it was it, the blueprint. Exactly, it starts out as a yeah, serial right. killer flick, but it's actually a vampire flick. And the, yeah, that's the, cool. 
the concept is if you were a vampire, what American city would you live in? You'd live in Las Vegas because it's a. I don't know if you live city. in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I guess it, it's a city that never sleeps, and you yeah, can literally yeah. travel from one end of the strip to the other and not go outside. Do what the hell you like? Yeah, exactly. You'd never have to go out in the sun. That's so, exactly yeah, it actually right. Actually, does yeah. make sense. Yeah. But anyway, if you've not seen it, it's totally worth checking out. All right, the night still I'll put on the list. The night Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, and I think as well the. Isn't the the people that do Castlevania are talking about doing uh, Devil May Cry as an animated series, which I am here for. Yeah. If oh, okay, that. yeah. I, I only played the amazing. first two of that game, but yeah, it's a great game and aesthetically yeah. very similar. So yeah, Dante Dante totally fits that world. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Right, we're gonna um, close out this uh, vampire frenzy with now. Um, obviously, this is the start of a trilogy. Uh, what else do you yeah. have in store for us? Like mini spoiler? <laughs> I mean, in terms of what's coming up next, mm. I mean, it, it'll be book two of Empire. Uh, I have, <laughs> I have the third, I have the third Aurora Cycle book coming out in November. Um, yes, so we have a special edition. Part. Yeah, you do. Yes. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's uh, YA sci-fi series that I write mm -hmm. with another Melbourne author, Amy Kaufman. Um, and the third part of that, third and final part of that is coming out in November. So I kind of have the launch of a new series in September, the end of another series in November. Um, and then it's 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 going to be full bore on Empire 2 until I actually get it written. I'm already getting letters from my editor saying, so when's the next one coming? And it's like, the first one isn't even out yet. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they are, they are cracking the whip already. So Empire 2 will be next up after that. Amazing. <laughs> I can't wait, mate. Thanks. Th mm. Can't wait until people have actually got their physical copies of our special yeah, edition either. of Empire of the Vampire in their hands, actually. Mm -hmm. and, um, it looks amazing. Yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. special editions have been just incredible. Um, oh, yeah. Thanks so yeah, so thanks, for, thanks for all your support, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, thank, well, thanks for writing such epic books. And uh, you have been watching Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner. This is the mighty Laura Jane Dodd. And we've been privileged to be joined by the great Jay Kristoff talking about his all new novel, Empire of the Vampire, which you can order from the links attached to this conversation. Thanks for joining us, mate. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.